So I'm going to talk a little bit about physiotherapy for hypermobility and EDS. Made it a little bit broader uh, because I realized as I was creating this presentation for you guys that that's really more what I was going to be talking about. Um, and then of course it's always to consider who's speaking to you when you're listening to information. So I come from a, a multidisciplinary clinic um, that treats children and adolescents at sick kids. So the Sick Kids EDS clinic was started the same time that the adult clinic uh, launched, and I've been working there for just about two years now. Um, prior to that, I did my physiotherapy degree at the University of Toronto. Um, I had been working at Sick Kids in other areas, and I also spent some time working in private practice orthopedics. So I've done some. Um, continued education in manual therapy and neurodevelopmental therapy as well as part of my previous roles. Um, prior to becoming a physio, I came from the research world. So I was actually doing medical research um, as part of a biomedical engineering degree at the Mount Sinai Hospital. And I did do engineering as an undergrad in the States. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And uh, our clinic, like the adult clinic, is a multidisciplinary team. So we have a geneticist, nurse practitioner, social worker, psychologist, um, myself, and a genetic counselor. Um, so it's a team approach. When you come into the clinic to see us, you'll meet with multiple team members so that we can try to make a plan for you. Um, so the objectives for today, I want to update you guys, the patient group, on the latest research and clinical perspectives regarding physio management of joint hypermobility with complications. So I'm going to outline the physiotherapy management principles that I use at this point in time. It's always changing and evolving. Um, based on my personal clinical experience and then also global standard of care. Sorry, guys. Um, so uh, as N Dr. Uh, Mattel mentioned, we were fortunate enough to go to the International EDS Symposium in Belgium. Um, and there was a physiotherapy workshop, which I think was the maybe the only part of the conference that was a little bit more management focused. So um, I'm going to include the research that was presented there throughout my talk um, to make this sort of meet the global standard of care that we're working from at this point in time. And then I also wanted to discuss future directions for physiotherapy, education, outreach, and resources in Canada, which is part of what we're trying to do at this clinic, is not just consult and treat, but also shape how um, other physiotherapists in the community can access information and learn from us. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about joint hypermobility. I know most of you have a, probably have a pretty good idea of what this is since you experience it. Um, so the people who I come who come in to see us at the EDS clinic, who need to see me, mostly are dealing with joint hypermobility and pain and fatigue because of that. So joint hypermobility on its own is not necessarily a problem and it might not be a problem at certain points in your life and it might become a problem later on. So it can fluctuate. Um, but the patients that I see, real, the real reason that they want um, to see a physio is because they have lower activity tolerance. So because of these symptoms, they can't participate in the things that they want to do. And that's where physio can help, I think, on a, a really functional level. So, again, I know you guys know a lot about joint hypermobility, and this was talked about a lot at the, the international conference of how do we measure it and what tools can we use beyond the baton to really take a look at the other joints. So there's two tools that um, they've developed. It's actually the... Uh, the physiotherapist that uh, Namesh mentioned, it's actually J-U-U-L, Christensen, just <laughs> to correct his spelling. Um, so sh um, she, along with the F Australian group, have developed two tools that look at upper limb and lower limb hypermobility in a little more detail, because we recognize that while the baton is a, is a something that's used as part of the criteria, it doesn't really encompass everything that we understand about joint hypermobility. So 
part of what I'm trying to do is also be better at um, defining what joint hypermobility is and how we can um, assess and then eventually treat it. So, of course, you can have just one or a few joints that are hypermobile, and that's local hypermobility, or many or most joints in the body, and this is generalized hypermobility. And again, this can occur in anyone, and it can be asymptomatic, but it often presents in people with connective tissue disorders, like EDS, like Marfan's. So I think what I'm gonna talk about today can apply to a broader population than just um, talking on EDS, even though that's the clinic that I come from. So um, Nimesh talked a little bit about the different systems that make, can make a joint hypermobile or not. Um, so it can be you know, the bone shape, um, it can be loose or lax connective tissues that surround the joint, and this is where a connective tissue disorder would be uh, involved. And then also low muscle tone, so the muscles aren't doing a good job of supporting the joint. So it can be any of these individually or any combination of these things. And I find a lot of times the bottom two are what I'm mostly dealing with. So. Unfortunately, surgeries that address um, this looser, lax connective tissues are not very successful in this patient population because of the difference in healing of those soft tissues. So um, I think that's still something that we need to explore a little bit more. I know that um, the adult clinic, they're going to be looking into that, um, as you saw in the earlier presentation. But for me, I... I'm going to focus on that third option, the lower muscle tone. So we can't stop all of the hypermobility from being there with treating the muscles, but we can help. So this is the kind of the part that I'm going to talk about targeting today. Um, so what does a physiotherapist do? I'm sure many of you have had interactions with physios, maybe more than one. Um, but really their job is to build, maintain, and guide you through a plan that's going to address your symptoms um, and, and those symptoms associated with joint hypermobility. So help you do what you want to do. And this is something I stress to my patients, that there's not a recipe that we can follow. It's, it's whatever is important to you, that's what we want to start to to help. Um, also, coming from a pediatric background, we want to prevent worsening or new symptoms in the future. So we're thinking ahead where you're at now and how this could affect you in the future. Um, physios are movement specialists, so we can assess the way you currently move or don't move and facilitate changes that can help you reach your goals. But that sounds nice, but what are these changes that we're talking about? What's included in the plan? So. I'm gonna show you, a, this is kind of an example of what you might get if, if you were just an average Joe with a sports injury and you went to see an orthopedic or a sports physiotherapist. So what they'd probably do is start with proximal muscle strengthening, which means muscles close to your core. Um, once those are stronger, they move to distal or muscles that are further away from your core. Um, then you'd start some sport or task specific exercises. And then finally, you get to start work on some higher level stuff, balance, agility. And this is where proprioception comes in. I'm going to talk a lot about proprioception a little bit later. Um, but basically, when they're at this point, you are pretty well back to where you were in terms of your sport. You get discharged. You're better. You never have to think about physio again. This is, is something that we learn in school of how to treat a sports injury. So you can imagine if you're coming to someone in the community who doesn't have exposure to other types of injuries, this seems like a reasonable plan. And I'm not saying it's a bad plan. <laughs> and there certainly are physiotherapists out there who don't follow this. So this is not all physios. <laughs> um, but I think we need to approach physiotherapy for people with hypermobility a little bit differently. Um, we're going to kind of flip this around and there's also some special considerations that we need to take into account too based on that hypermobility. Um, one of the studies that they showed at the International Symposium was looking at shoulder hypermobility 
And even with people who had objectively strong shoulder muscles, um, if they were holding weights of a certain amount down at their side, they could show with ultrasound that there was a significant amount of, of gapping at the shoulder joint. So despite strengthening and being strong, we need to also think about how we're moving and what kind of things we're doing in the context of hypermobility. So um, this is sort of my current um, approach for exercise progression for hypermobility related symptoms. So I think the most important switch is that we put body awareness and proprioception at the bottom. That's the thing we need to start focusing on because it's really where the, how we move starts from. Then we can move up to core and trunk muscle training. And notice I'm not saying strengthening, but training. So getting stronger, but also knowing how to use it. Um, the next step is putting things together. Um, I'm calling this neuromuscular integration, but that's just a fancy way of saying putting the skills and the two bottom parts together. And then finally at the top, we get on functional strengthening. But Physiotherapy is not just about exercise. So there's some other things that we need to add into this management plan. Um, along one side, I think improving cardiovascular fitness is a really important thing to work on with this population. A lot of times when they come to see us because of pain, understandably, their levels of fitness are not what we would want. And this can help with your joint hypermobility and pain, but also other symptoms um, that involve the cardiovascular system. So that's a really important box. Um, then on the other side, we have some strategies for managing symptoms. Um, as I said, that we can strengthen our muscles all we want, but you are still going to have that underlying joint hypermobility. So we need to have some strategies for managing symptoms that are going to come up um, because of that. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this box because we've got some excellent talks lined up later in the day that are going to go into things like mindfulness, manual therapy, pain modalities, pacing, neurodynamics, kinds of treatments that you can access from physio that can help manage your symptoms. So I'm going to kind of stay focused on the middle part today. Um, so we'll talk first about proprioception. So what is proprioception? People talk a lot about it when they're talking about physio for joint hypermobility. Um, it was originally invented, this word, to describe a person's sense of where the body is and how their body moves in space. So what exactly does that mean? I have made a simplified version to help explain this. So I hope there's no neurophysiologists in the room. They could probably find some issues with this, but I'm going to try my best. So. Um, so a sense of where your body is in space. So all of our connective tissues have uh, nerves that can send sensory input to our brain. So our muscles, our joints, our ligaments, tendons, they feel things like pressure and stretch, and they can t send the, that information to our brain, which can decide, okay, because of the way that this feels to all these tissues, my brain knows my elbow is bent to 90 degrees. I can tell that without looking at it. Um, so why is that important? Well, if we're going to move from any position, we need to know where we're starting from. So if you want to do something functional, like reach for the cup, your brain has to tell your elbow, OK, I need to reach for that cup. I'm bent. I need to straighten. So things get a little more complicated as we're moving because we've got changing inputs from those muscles, joints, ligaments, and tendons that are tough talking to our brain, telling us where we are, we are and how we're moving, and then also we're doing motor output to tell us to keep going and to modify that movement to get where we need to be. So this is sounds pretty complicated, and we're really only talking about reaching for a cuff at this point. So you can understand that um, movements that are more complicated, like walking, standing from a chair, going upstairs, dancing. We've got a lot more going on um, for these types of movements. So what do we know about proprioception and joint hypermobility? There are several studies in both children's and adults um, that demonstrate that this population has decreased proprioceptive acuity compared to non-hypermobile controls at baseline. Um, the good news is there have also been a few studies demonstrating that with physiotherapy that focuses on proprioceptive training, um, 
the proprioceptive acuity was improved. But not only that, they found that the symptoms were also better. So a therapy program po focusing on learning how to move better was successful and also helped with symptoms. So this is where I think physio for this population can really help. Um, and then clinically, this is kind of what I see. What I know about proprioception and, and people with hypermobility is that they don't have a good sense of where their body is. And then once we start to move, it's even a little bit worse. So um, I see this a lot with the kids I see. I, I, I thought I was sitting up straight. I thought I was standing on both my feet equally. So um, just starting that education process, I think, is a really big first step. Now, when we learn about proprioception in school, we, we usually talk about high-level things, jumping on one foot, walking on a balance beam. But proprioception and body awareness, can, we can start to train that in simple exercises. So I have a, just an example of something that I sometimes do to start getting people learning about body awareness and proprioception. They're not really interchangeable terms, but at this level, I like to talk about body awareness because really what I'm trying to get the patients to do is feel how their body's moving, pay attention to the things that they're sensing, and then figuring out how to control that to find a center or a neutral um, space. So if you're sitting off to the side, like the kid in, in my first uh, picture, I'll get them to do an activity in sitting where you shift to one side, shift to the other side, and then find the middle. And that's a pretty simple exercise that you can do to start to learn a little bit more about how your body moves if you're paying attention while you're doing it. Um, and I like to stress that this is finding center through movement. So we're talking about um, moving and also positioning. So um, coming back to my management strategy, we're going to move up to core and trunk muscle training. So I get a lot of questions about posture and alignment and being really concerned with um, how we're sitting and can, what are we doing to get sort of perfect alignment, perfect posture. And really, I like to tell people that Perfect posture, I don't think, really means having perfect alignment. I think it means having variety, moving, not just sitting in one position that's stressing the ligaments, not sitting or standing in positions that are passively um, relying on structures to hold you up, um, but changing so that you can use a variety of different muscles and structures to support the way that you're sitting or standing or doing whatever it is in your life. So you know, this guy with the specific angles at his joints. I, I think even though that's technically very perfect and well aligned, if you sat like that for an hour or two, you'd get sore, even though it's perfect. Um, so this other image is a pretty ridiculous chair from Norway that I found on the internet. And I don't suggest that you get it. I don't know anything about it. I think it was $2,000. <laughs> but I like the picture because it illustrates that their focus is on variety. So within one day, they could be in all different kinds of positions um, and not just staying in one spot, which is the most important thing for posture, in my opinion. So um, where do we start then with core and trunk muscle training? I, I can't give you exercises and things without, of course, seeing you. You need to go see a physiotherapist before you start anything. But a good place to start, just to give you an example of something simple that can work, that works for a lot of my patients, is diaphragmatic breathing. Um, so the diaphragm is our, our breathing muscle. And it's interconnected um, through a neural network with our other inner core muscles. So the muscles that are really deep in the body that help to support and help with postural control. Um, the diaphragm is linked to those. And it's an accessible one. It's, it's kind of the one that I use, that I say to get people accustomed to using their core, get them acquainted with their core. You can feel it moving. You can feel it working when you're practicing this breathing exercise. And it's something that um, most people can can learn to do in one session. So it's something that I like to start. Obviously, from there, we'd move on to some more advanced things based on whatever that patient was interested in doing. Um, but that's just an example for you guys to get an idea. So 
Neuromuscular integration is kind of a fancy way that I use to say putting these skills together for a functional purpose. Um, there's a lot of different treatment strategies and techniques that people use um, to do this kind of thing. I personally have a little bit of training in neurodevelopmental therapy, um, and that's a little bit where I come from, but I think it's important as a therapist to kind of consider what's going on all around you and know that things aren't gonna work for the same person the same way. So having a variety of tools in your toolbox, so to say, to treat people. Um, so we're gonna involve all of these things, proprioception, our core and trunk muscle control, and then add things that are a little more difficult like coordination and balance. Um, and I liked this picture because the physio is doing something that I do a lot, which is some hands-on cueing to help learn to move again. Um, and so she's cueing the core, and she's also providing some distal feedback, which is uh, she's putting pressure through that ball, which again comes back to what we were talking about with hypermobility-specific exercises. So with any shoulder movement, it's it's good to have something that you're holding on to that's instead of just moving your arms out in space, for example. Um, so I like that picture because it involves all of those things. So functional strengthening, why is that one at the top? Um, basically, hopefully I've been able to describe to you that it's important first to build a strong base uh, before we try to strengthen our distal muscles. We also want to learn how to do something before we add stress or load to that movement. So practicing things before you add load is going to be important to help avoid reinforcing bad habits is what people start calling them, but I would call them dysfunctional movement patterns. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about cardiovascular fitness. Um, of course, we know staying active is important for your overall health. Um, but aerobic exercise helps all of your muscles work more efficiently. And this includes the skeletal muscles that we're using f to help control our joint hypermobility. Um, so low aerobic endurance leads to weaker, more fatigable muscles, which can actually make our symptoms worse. Muscle tone is one of those pieces of our joint stability. So um, if we don't have that piece, then it, we can, it can make the symptoms worse. Um, I think physio should help you work on strategies to participate in activity. A lot of times it's just you're hearing a lot that you need to go do more exercise, but what does that look like um, in a practical sense? So I talk about this, I think it's a very understandable thing that happens to people. You're in pain, so you rest. You get some weakness or imbalance, movement becomes more painful, you move less, and you just kind of spiral down, and it's really hard to break out of this, and I think it's understandable that this would happen. Um, the good news is that we can intervene at any point, um, but how do we do that? So a lot of people that I see are trying really hard to be more active. So they'll go out and do a lot because they don't want to be inactive, they want to do exercise, but then they crash and they have... Um, symptoms, they can't walk for days, and they try again, but ultimately their activity tolerance is decreasing. So what I work on with any exercise or anything I suggest for someone to start is pacing. So we, we work out a time that, um, a small time chunk and force yourself to take breaks and go through um, so that overall we can increase our activity tolerance. And I found that this really works. And there is a, a worksheet, I think you can download it for free from Psychology Tools that goes through, it has like a little worksheet you can fill out with times for a specific activity that you want to try to increase your tolerance for. Uh, it's psychologytools.com. Yeah, it's, it's very small at the bottom, sorry. I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, so how do we get or stay motivated to move? It's hard work. Physio and exercise is hard work. Um, I have the benefit of working with a pediatric population, so I have to be creative and make everything about meaningful movement. Kids aren't going to go home and do exercises that don't mean anything to them. And I'm not inclined to do that either as an adult. Despite what you see on this slide, I think physio for adults can be fun as well. I just couldn't find any pictures on the internet of <laughs> adults enjoying physio, so <laughs> hopefully we can change that. <laughs> <laughs> They're all very serious about sitting on a therapy ball. That was what I was trying to find. But anyways, um, so 
for example, for shoulder, for a child, instead of giving them five different exercises for range of motion, go put a paper on the wall and paint a picture. You get the same thing done and you have fun doing it. So I think that, that making it meaningful to you is a really important part of your physio plan. Um, my other suggestion is to leave with a plan. So you're going to physio, but what are you going to do for yourself? And I just have a, a sheet that has three boxes on it. Prevention, what am I doing to prevent symptoms and protect my body? Improvement, what are my goals and what am I doing to reach those? And then management. If you do have symptoms, and we can predict that symptoms are going to fluctuate, so we want to be ready for that. So if you do have symptoms or flare or an injury, um, what can I do to manage it? So I made up a plan and filled it in just so you could get an idea of what this might look like for someone. Um, so prevention, we've got a daily core and body awareness routine. Maybe this is walking in the pool. Maybe it's Tai Chi. Maybe it's mat exercises. It looks different for everybody. Um, we've got something at their desk to help them move throughout the day and not stay static in a static position. And then we're using the pacing worksheet so that we avoid that um, drop in activity participation. Um, this is actually a real goal from a patient. I had to participate in a 3K walk. So we had a structured plan, and then we alternated that with low-impact activities so that it was more manageable um, while still helping to strengthen those muscles. And then management, These are this really looks different for everybody. It depends on what your symptoms are, um, but just some examples of some of the other types of things that I would do for people. So um, for the future directions of our clinic and the adult clinic, we're working on outreach and becoming more of a resource for community therapists. We recognize that there are great therapists in the community who have heard about connective tissue disorders, but more often it's hard to find someone who knows what you're talking about. So we're trying to evaluate um, need and develop a plan to address therapist education in Ontario. Um, so we're talking with the University of Toronto and also thinking about what else we could do for community therapists to provide a place to go or somewhere they can access to uh, have more information. And then on the research side of things, we also want to contribute to the research for EDS and hypermobility related complications and we're working with some of the groups um, that we saw uh, that I met with at the international symposium to try and uh, develop some studies so um, that's again those are three of the worksheets that I use from that website uh, I think you can download five for free or something so if you're interested and then if anyone has any questions or comments I'd love to